This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So we're going to go through and have a look at the exam question that's called Suntory. Uh, you'll need to download the question from the ACCA website. If you're looking to find it on the ACCA website, it's from the P2 resources and it is looking at the international variants okay and you will find it in the hybrid paper from the september and december 2016 sitting i think if memory serves me right uh, it looks like it is question number two within this hybrid paper that's been put together okay excellent have you got it at hand let's begin so what have we got okay uh well whenever we go through and look at this type of question uh we need to think about our approach and the approach is pretty standard what we see across all of these types of questions okay uh, so what you've got there first of all I make sure you read and understand the requirements and as well at the same time make sure you allocate the time available to answer the question <laughs> we can all read so we can all read the requirement but understanding it is important uh, the time available is entirely up to you how you decide to approach the exam these days uh, it used to be three hours with 15 minutes of reading and planning time, wasn't it? Uh, so you had the 15 minutes of reading and planning time, and then three hours to answer the question. Now you've just got three and a quarter hours, haven't you? Okay. Uh, so I think if you work out three and a quarter hours, I think it works out at 1.95 minutes per mark. Okay. Uh, so feel free to use 1.95 minutes per mark if you're just going to go through and use the full three and a quarter hours to pass the exam uh, to attempt the exam or alternative you could stick with, with the old situation and think well I need 15 minutes of reading and planning time to understand what's happening in, in each of the questions I need some of that time to go through and understand which of the optional questions I'm going to answer uh, so you might think well I'll give myself 15 minutes to do that the remaining three hours means I then have 1.8 minutes per mark it's entirely up to you I just want to make sure that you allocate your time appropriately, whether it's 1.8 or 1.95 minutes per mark. OK, so uh, let's go through, have a look at the actual requirements. Uh, you've got 25 marks of those 25 marks. Two are there for clarity and quality of presentation. So we'll emphasize that as we go along. Make sure that for each section, A, B or C, you start it on a new page. Make sure that for each section you put in a heading. Uh, make sure as well that if you can put in a heading for every section that you then write underneath like subheadings uh, and also in terms of the clarity we're thinking well structured full English sentences okay yeah please be short please be to the point on those sentences uh, but make sure that they are full proper sentences okay excellent because they should be two really easy marks okay uh, likewise, it says the mark allocation is shown against each of the three issues. Again, that's going to be important, isn't it? To ensure that you know how long to spend on each part of the question. And then the important bit, the most important, it says discuss the advice which should be given to Suntory in each of the above cases with reference to the relevant international financial reporting standards. So it's not saying you have to go through and, you know, uh, write out the rules. By all means, reference back to the rules uh, when you're answering the question with regards to the advice. OK, uh, so tell them what to do with regards to the advice and then because and link it into the scenario that you have within the question and the rules. OK, uh, you need to know your rules. If you don't know the rules under your IFRSs, you are going to genuinely be in lots and lots and lots of trouble okay uh, once you've done that uh, you've got an idea what the requirement is we need to look at the advice to Suntory we need to use IFRS's and refer back to them we then need to understand the specific requirements of each section okay because there is if you like a sub requirement in part A B and C that a lot of people don't realize is there and then determine how many marks are needed to pass each section. That is fundamentally important. Okay, Don't put all your eggs in one basket and try and get one part 100% correct and nothing else on the rest of the section. You need to answer all parts and pass all parts. If you can do that, you'll pass the question. Okay, So what do we mean? Well, let's look at the specific requirements. Uh, 
Uh, if you've got the paper in front of you, what you'll find is that the specific requirements for each of part A, B and C. So what it wants you to do for A, B and C is nearly always in the last sentence of the section. So if you have a look at part A, uh, what you should find there is it says the directors require advice on the determination of each of the functional currencies of Suntory, Mayer and Minor. OK, so it's talking about functional currencies. Have we spoken about functional currencies before? Yes, we have. OK, we need to apply it to three separate entities. OK, and if you look at the mark scheme, you've got nine marks. If you start thinking about it logically, nine marks. I've got three companies to talk about. Well, is that not three marks each? OK, if I'm looking to pass, uh, I need half of the nine. So is that four and a half? If I'm thinking about time available, uh, if you're working it on 1.8 minutes, you're talking about 16 minutes. Uh, if you're working it at 1.95, you're talking about 17 and a half, 18 minutes. Okay. Uh, so somewhere between 16 and 18 minutes, you need to go through there uh, and get yourself four and a half marks. Five marks to you and I. Can you do it? Of course you can. Nice and straightforward. Okay. If you look at part B, uh, again, the last sentence within part B, it says the director of Suntory require advice on how to deal with the trademark. So we're specifically looking at the accounting treatment of a trademark in the financial statements for the year ended November 20X or 2016. OK, so we need to identify what a trademark actually is before we then start identifying how to look at the accounting treatment. OK, within there, you'll find, I think, is it seven marks to pass? You need three and a half. So let's say four and the time available. You take your seven marks and multiply it by either your 1.8 or your 1.95, depending upon what you see fit. OK, depending upon your exam approach. Personally, I spend 15 minutes reading and planning to make sure I know what questions I'm doing, what I'm going to answer, how I'm going to answer it to make sure I know my approach. And I'd use the 1.8 minutes then for the remaining three hours. But it's up to you. OK, if you want to go gung ho, then yeah, do it all in three and 15. OK, and then part C, you can see that again right at the end. Uh, the directors of Suntory require advice on the identification and disclosure of the company's related parties and preparing its separate financial statements for the same year ended November 16. OK, so at least we know what the specific requirements are. OK, uh, we can see that in the first one, it's all about some functional currencies. In the second one, it's about the accounting treatment of a trademark. And then in the third one, it's to do with related parties in terms of the identification and the disclosure. And that last one there is worth seven marks. OK, excellent. Uh, so once you've understood the specific requirements and you know how many marks there are to pass, which order you are going to attempt them in? <laughs> Pardon me. A weak student will go through and go, well, I'll do A, I'll do B, and I'll do C. Okay, and do it in that order because that's the order that they are within the question. No! Scandalous! Have a look at the specific requirements again and look at what they are and then determine the order. Okay? A, B, C. Okay, which is going to be first? You want to talk about functional currencies in IS21, uh, which you've seen in F7, if memory serves me right. OK, uh, trademarks, trademarks. What's a trademark? OK, uh, a trademark is like the golden arches, isn't it? OK, uh, that you've got at McDonald's or the, the swoosh that you get uh, on your Nike branded trainers or maybe the three stripes that you have uh, using Adidas. They are a trademark, aren't they? Uh, the, the swoosh, the stripes, the, the golden arches uh, bring money to a business, don't they? Okay, They are an asset. It's something that the business controls. Yeah, they control the use uh, of the trademark. That trademark then brings them in future economic benefits, doesn't it? You know, if you see the golden arches, you think, ooh, quite fancy a McDonald's. Okay, Whereby if you see some other random business that, that sells fast food, you think, oh, no, 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 thank you. I'd sooner go to McDonald's. They do great shit, don't they? Okay. Uh, so essentially, back to it, it's an intangible asset, okay? It's a resource that you control. It gives you future economic benefits. Uh, it has no physical substance, so it's an intangible asset. So it's asking you to think about the treatment of an intangible in part B, Ooh, a bit tricky, and then related parties in part C. Uh, personally, and you may think differently, uh, I would go through there and think about functional currencies first, and then think about C, and then I'll probably go and do B. The reason why I put B to the back is, okay, it's intangibles. You might like intangibles, but 
there's some numbers there within the question and when you're looking at numbers you have to deal with the numbers and sometimes that, that can be a bit tricky if you do it earlier on you might get bogged down in the numbers and waste some time okay so i'm going to do a c and b in that order okay uh, so once you've got the approach in terms of which way you can do it then for each part you are able to identify the accounting standards that are likely to be relevant and i think we've touched upon that already and then once you know the accounting standard, make sure you know the basic rules of that accounting standard. Hopefully you'll find those within our notes that we've discussed through tuition. So if we look at part C, did I say we'll do A, then C, then B? I've changed my mind. We'll do C, related parties. It's up to you. Hotel, motel. Makes no difference. Okay. <laughs> so what have you got? Uh, for each part, identify the accounting standards that are likely to be relevant. Well, here it's nice and straightforward, isn't it? It's related parties, if you want. IS24. You don't need the accounting standard number. Okay. It's all about related parties. And what are the basic rules? Well, the rules that we talk about are the definition. So what constitutes a related party? And what's the disclosure? Okay. Uh, so the definition of related party is what you have up there, isn't it? Okay, it's whereby there is control, uh, joint control, uh, influence, uh, key management personnel, close family member of that management personnel, uh, and also that, that funny little one at the bottom, uh, any pension plan, post-employment uh, is also a related party, okay? Other than that post-employment pension plan, uh, whereby there is control or influence or an unbroken chain of control or influence, that gives you a related party. Okay. In terms of the disclosure, you've got it there. Okay. Yeah, you need to disclose any transactions that there have been, the amounts that there have, any outstanding balances, any amounts that have been written off, any allowances that you've made in terms of your doubtful debts as well. Okay. You know, the key bit there is you're giving the information to the users to ensure there that they understand what has happened with regards to this transaction. Even if it's an arm's length transaction, it makes no difference. It still gets disclosed. OK, if it's not an arm's length, it still gets disclosed in exactly the same fashion. OK, excellent. So what have we got in terms of part C? Well, if you go through and read it. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, it tells us that the three people own shares. The finance director owns 60%. So if we talk about the finance director owning 60%, boom, put in finance director as a subheading. Remember, I would have it as part C. I would have it as related parties. And then subheading finance director. State the obvious. The finance director is a related party. Please don't go through and say per IAS 24. The rules are as follows. And list out all the rules. No. That's such a rubbish answer. Horrendous. You're just copying out rules. Be specific. Be to the point. Okay. It's asking you to dis define whether or not it is or isn't a related party. It is. Why? Control. That's what I've said. The finance director is a related party because he owns greater than 50% of the voting shares and is therefore deemed to have control. Okay. Excellent. It then goes on. Uh, within the question, the operations director owns 30%. Is that a related party? No. Yes, it is. Okay. Because it's greater than 20%. In between that 20 and 50%, which, which pushes towards influence, doesn't it? So the operations director is a related party because he owns 30% of the voting shares. And this is deemed to give significant influence. Okay. There we go. Again, simple. A lot of people will see the next bit. The third owner is a passive investor who does not help manage the entity. Okay. Don't need to write anything about that. Yes, you do. Tell them it's not a related party. That's what students do and lose marks. I think I only need to tell somebody when it is a related party. You need to tell them when it isn't. Okay. And here it isn't. Yeah. The passive investor is not a related party. Why? Because they do not help manage Suntorium. So have no control or influence. Okay. How about that? Think you could write that? I'm sure you could. There were nine marks available. Okay. I've written three things. Every time I write it, I get a mark. It's clear. It's well presented. There will be some two extra marks as well at the end. Okay. But I'm doing well. Okay. Everybody happy with that there? Brilliant. As I go through there and move on. 
<laughs> I begin to go through there and start talking about the wife of the finance director uh, is the sales director of Suntory. Okay. Uh, is the sales director a related party? Yes, she is. Uh, why? She is a, the wife of the FD and therefore a close family member of a related party. Okay, so the sales director is also a related party. Okay. It then goes on to say their son is currently taking an internship with Suntory, receives a salary of £30,000 per annum, which is normal compensation. Couldn't care whether it's normal compensation or not. Nice salary, $30,000 per annum. Uh, but in terms of the son, we're thinking about related parties. Is he a related party? Is he a close family member? Of the finance director. Yes. Yeah, the son of the finance director is a related party. As he is a close family member of the FD and the sales director. Okay. Uh, there we go. Excellent. It doesn't really matter whether or not the sales director would have been a related party. In this instance, the son is a close family member of the FD. Who is a related party. So the son is a related party. An unbroken chain. Of control and influence okay excellent uh, in the next paragraph it says the FD and the SD the finance director and sales director have set up an investment company called Balil uh, they jointly own Balil and their shares will eventually be transferred to the son when he's finished the internship with Suntory couldn't care less what happened with regards to the transfer of the ownership at the end Balil is it a related party yes okay because it is under the joint control of two of Suntory's related parties. Okay. Uh, being both the finance director and the sales director. A little bit harder that one. Okay. But again, yeah, you've got the finance director, the sales director. They jointly control Belil. Okay. So they'd be related parties of Belil. But also then Belil is a related party of Suntory because they are related parties themselves of Suntory. There's an unbroken chain of control. Okay. Excellent. That one's a little bit more of a challenge. So maybe you didn't get that one right. But if you got the other two right. There's two marks on top of the three. That's five. That's five out of nine. Plus the two marks at the end. You've comfortably passed this part of the question. Okay. Excellent. Be careful. Make sure you answer the question in full. Because not only did it go through there and want you to talk about the identification, it also wanted you to talk about the disclosure. Okay, uh, and the disclosure, what you've got there, is all about is it the loan guarantee? Okay, uh, it says there on the first of June, twenty sixteen, Suntory obtained a bank loan of five hundred thousand, fixed interest rate six percent. It's repaid, is it, in November seventeen? So in a year's time. Uh, the key bit is it says the repayment of the principal and interest is secured by a guarantee. Uh, and that is against the home of the FD. Okay. Well, the FD is a related party. So that related party is providing the guarantee. Okay. Uh, so is the loan guarantee to be disclosed? I would have thought so. Okay. Yeah, because I think the shareholders would need to know that a related party is giving that guarantee to, is it the, our company, Suntory, okay? Uh, again, I think if you look into the details of IS24, it does categorically state that any guarantees given should be disclosed, okay? So just state it there, the guarantee given by the director over the 500,000, I've said pounds, should say dollars, let's not worry about that, should be disclosed as the guarantee is with a related party. Okay, excellent. I think I said this question was 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 about nine marks. Correct me. Uh, it is seven. Okay. Uh, so the guarantee uh, is part of a related party. It needs to be disclosed. Don't forget your general disclosures as well. On top of that, uh, if any transactions have taken place between Suntory and any of the related parties identified above, so whether that's the Sun, Belil, the FD, the sales director, uh, then disclosure of the relationship with the amount then the outstanding balances should be disclosed okay simple as that okay don't start listing out all the disclosures keep it brief okay two extra marks there uh, that is comfortably enough to get you a hundred percent on that part of the question okay related parties get tested quite regularly even though it's a small area in terms of an accounting standard so get good at it okay excellent there we go 
Uh, in terms of part A, uh, it says identify the accounting standards that are likely to be relevant. So we did this before, didn't we? With part C to identify that it was related parties. Here, it's your foreign currency and that's under IS21. And you've got the rules there. Okay, again, that's taken from what we have seen and discussed before within our lectures. Uh, and the key bit is remember the functional currency is the primary economic environment where we operate which is determined based upon the currency that dominates and determines the sales price, which influences your operating costs and thinks about your entity's finance and how that's provided as well. Okay, there we go. That's it. So what have we got? Uh, think about, is it there first of all, Suntory? So again, separate it out. Okay, again, the examiner's made it much easier for you. Yeah, you can read through yourself the first paragraph. It gives you background information about where the entities operate. Suntory, Mayor and Minor. And then in the second paragraph down, it tells you a little bit more about Suntory to help you determine whether or not the functional currency is the dollar or something else. And here, I think it's quite clear, isn't it? You know, it says Suntory sales are mainly in its own jurisdiction and priced and collected in dollars. Uh, the legal requirements and the environment uh, determines the pricing of the Suntory products. So again, backing up uh, that the local jurisdiction has the determination on the pricing. So again, that would be in dollars. Uh, goods and services are sourced locally and paid in dollars. Okay, there are some other transactions that take place in other currencies, but that's fairly minor, isn't it? So here for three marks, state that it is the functional currency is the dollar. Why? So using that word because sales are priced and collected in dollars, goods and services are paid in dollars. And again, just make reference to the small amounts that are traded in other currencies don't impact the choice of our functional currency. OK, so I think that was probably one of the easier ones to get for three marks. <laughs> the next paragraph, again, you're thinking, will it help me? Uh, it talks about Maya conducting its business with significant autonomy from Suntory. Uh, it manufactures its golf equipment and it sells it mainly in Japanese yen. Uh, local management determine prices based upon the local legal and business conditions. So again, it seems that given that the local management uh, are in charge of sales prices, they're priced and collected in yen, it looks like the functional currency is going to be the yen. Double check, uh, raw materials and labour are sourced from local suppliers. Uh, again, makes you think about yen. Again, specialised equipment sourced from China. Okay, that's fine. Okay, it's only a small amount. Uh, again, the purchases are from Suntory. Some of them are in dollars. Again, that doesn't impact the choice because they are just small amounts. The majority of sales, the, the lion's share of the costs are all priced up in yen. So therefore, the yen is the functional currency of Mayor, okay? Don't start telling me the accounting treatment. If you start turning around and say, well, we recognize uh, the transaction at the, you know, historic cost and start looking at gains and losses or talk about consolidation, bleh, it doesn't ask you to do that. Go back to the requirement at the end of the section. It said, we want advice on the determination of each of the functional currencies. It doesn't want you to talk about the accounting treatment. You're right about the accounting treatment. I think you've done amazingly well on this question. You haven't. Because what you've written is right, but doesn't answer the question that's been set. So be careful. Answer the question in front of you, not what you think you should be answering. Okay. Word of warning. Uh, and then the last one that you've got there, that final chunky paragraph before the, the, the specific requirement talks about minor. I think if you read it through, you can see it's not as clear cut as Suntory and Mayor, is it? Okay. It says Mayor imports golf clothing manufactured by Suntory and pays in dollars. Okay. So we have some dollar payments. Uh, other operating expenses are paid in euros. My word. Okay. That's quite a lot going on. Uh, Suntory. Now that's the parent of this subsidiary Mayor. Uh, gives Mayor a discount on the normal selling price. Uh, Miner sells its products mainly in Portugal in euros. So we've got some operating expenses in euros. Most of our products are priced up in euros, but uh, we pay for the goods in dollars. A lot going on here. 
However, I think the key bit is that the local legal and business conditions and the cost of the product from Suntory dictate the pricing of products and all the prices have to be agreed by Suntory. So if you've got a parent that's agreeing the prices, okay, uh, they are going to determine what the price is. Now that price will be influenced, you know, based upon the exchange rates, aren't they? Because if we're paying things in euros, uh, if we're selling things in euros, we want to make sure that we don't lose out based upon the exchange rate, don't we? Uh, so we want to make sure that any exchange rate fluctuations are passed on to the customer, okay? Uh, so even though we go through and sell them in euros, the price is dictated by ourselves, Suntory. And Suntory, I don't forget, has the functional currency there, is it, of the dollar. Okay, so that's going to have an impact on what the functional currency there is uh, of minor. Okay, uh, if we read on, uh, it also goes through and says at the month end, an intergroup dividend is paid in cash to Suntory in euros. Uh, which amounts the net profit made by minor for the month end okay uh so again the exchange rates are going to have an impact aren't they because when you transfer back that euro profit you want to make sure that you're not losing out as the parent because of exchange rate fluctuations so when you set the prices it's going to be based upon the dollar uh, and how that will go through and translate into the euro won't it okay and don't forget if you've read the first part uh, this subsidiary minor is financed, is it there, by the parent in dollars. That's a lot to take in. So what have we got up there? Okay, it says minor's functional currency is more difficult to determine because of the following. Uh, sales are priced in euros, fact, but prices are dictated by Suntory, aren't they? And Suntory has the functional currency of the dollar. Uh, goods are paid in dollars. Uh, but other operating expenses are paid in euros. So therefore, I think the main thing then to consider uh, is the financing of the business to determine this functional currency. Because there's a bit of dollars, there's a bit of euros. You could mention about the exchange rates having an influence. I think that's a bit too high a skills. I would therefore say that given that the business is financed in dollars, the US dollar will therefore be the functional currency of minor. Okay. <sighs> That was a really tough one, that last one. But it does go through again in terms of the requirement and says discuss the advice. So you need to discuss both sides of it in terms of the euros, in terms of the dollars, in terms of the influence, in terms of the exchange rates. So you could write quite a bit of that about that one. It's the most difficult bit, but the thought the first two were pretty straightforward. OK, so you get enough marks easily to pass on the first two and then maybe get some bonus marks on that final bit there. OK. Happy with that one? Compare that answer to what you've got in terms of the model answer on the ACCA website. Totally different. That's what I would expect you to write within an exam. I would not expect you to regurgitate that answer that is on the ACCA website. That's far too detailed and not presented in the way that a student would be expected to present it. Okay. Finally, part B. Okay. Now, uh, what have we got? It says again, like we've done for the previous one, we need to identify the accounting standards likely to be relevant and the basic accounting rules. OK, <laughs> so what have we got here? Well, there was a trademark, wasn't there? So I think that's going to be an intangible. That's IS38. If you talk about intangibles and talk about IS38, you should do enough to be able to get yourself marks to pass. However, do just be careful. Because I think it goes on to talk as well, doesn't it, uh, about a competitor announcing a technological breakthrough, uh, which will reduce the demand for our product. Is that not an impairment indicator? Uh, in which case we need to think about, is it the IS 38? Oh, sorry, 36. Don't think about the standard numbers. You get them wrong. Okay, like I just did then. It's natural. Uh, so impairment IS 36. Just talk about impairments. Don't put the standard number in. And then ultra high level marks, if you can work it through, given that the competitor announced this new product, which has meant that there has been an impairment and it looks like it shortens the life of our product. I think we're now going to manufacture it until May 2018. That means there is a change in estimate of the useful life. <sighs> Harsh. Yeah. Wow, that's difficult. Uh, so there's a change in estimate, and that's governed by IS8, isn't it? Okay, change in estimate. You deal with the change and apply it to the carrying value. 
and then apply it prospectively, don't we? <sighs> wow. Yeah. Three standards in that small bit of information. Wow. Uh, that's why P2 is tough. Okay. You might focus on the trademark, think about the intangibles, and neglect the others. In terms of the rules, uh, you've got them there. Uh, so the acquisition of the trademark, which is what they do, isn't it? Uh, for $3 million, that's a separate acquisition. So the rules there, you capitalize it plus any directly attributable costs and then amortize it over the life of the asset when it's ready for use. Uh, the impairment, you've got those steps to identify the impairment. So here, I think there's an external indicator, isn't there, of the competitor launching the product. We need to then perform the impairment review. So compare the carrying value to the recoverable amount. If the carrying value is greater than the recoverable amount, it is impaired here. I presume we would just be applying it to the individual asset as opposed to the cash generating unit. I remember the recoverable amount is the higher the value in use and the fair value less cost to sell, isn't it? Uh, to record the impairment, it goes to profit or loss unless it's been previously revalued, in which case it goes to other comprehensive income first. Okay. And then anything else goes to profit or loss. And then we've already mentioned about the change in estimate and being prospectively. You apply it to the carrying value in this period and then any any future periods. Okay, again, all those copied, pasted from our notes. So here goes. Uh, so there's essentially three bits, aren't there, within there for the seven marks. So let's talk about the intangible. So head it up in your answer, intangible. The trademark is an intangible non-current asset. We capitalize it at the $3 million cost. Where? The statement of financial position. You know, it says... How do we deal with the trademark in the financial statement? So talk about the financial statement. So here in the SFP, amortized over its useful life of 10 years. Uh, annual amortization, therefore, of $0.3 million per annum. You could state that that goes there through profit or loss. You could further go on to explain as well, if you're talking about the financial statements, that there is a cash outflow of $3 million in your investing activities. I don't think that mentioned in the answer it's valid it's true it will gain you credit okay there we go uh, likewise in part b uh, moving on uh, there's a change in estimate whoa uh, that w w was pretty challenging wasn't it okay uh, there's a future launch of a competitor's new product that means the trademark is only going to provide economic benefit until may 2018 okay uh, the useful life of the trademark needs to be reassessed and the amortization charge adjusted accordingly. Uh, the carrying value at the date of change of 2.1 million. Okay. Uh, so where do we get that from? Uh, well, we bought it on December 2012 uh, to 2013 to 2014 to 2015. Okay. Uh, so that's three years. Uh, so three lots of 0.3 is 0.9. Three less 0.9 is 2.1 million. Okay, so therefore, that 2.1 million is amortized over the remaining useful life. Blech, horrible. Uh, we're talking from December 15 to December 16 uh, to December 17, which is two years. And then you've got to get your fingers out for 2018, uh, for January, February, March, April, May. Okay, uh, I think it should be, yeah, two and a half years, roughly. Okay. So much is it there about those half years? Okay, excellent. Ah, uh, it's because isn't it our November year end? Okay, uh, careful. Yes. Okay, so it's December, January, February, March, April, May. Okay, yeah, December fifteen. That's the very start of December uh, to May twenty eighteen. So two and a half years. So the new amortization charge is eight hundred forty thousand pounds per annum. Again, where did it go? That's there through profit or loss. Okay, and that will reduce the carrying value. Okay, excellent. Uh, so you've now got that new impairment, uh, or sorry, that new amortization charge applied to the asset from December 2015. We now then need to be careful because then, yes, it says, is it in that second paragraph at November 2016, the end of this current financial year, remember? That change in estimate was in the previous year, uh, well, the start of this year, essentially. Uh, Suntory assessed a recoverable amount of the trademark at $500,000. Uh, so what have we got? Right, we need to compare the carrying value to that recoverable amount. 
the carrying value, be careful, has been amortised by another year. Yeah, because we're at November 2016. So 2.1 million was the carrying value. We've got the new amortisation. So you'd have to use your own figure of 0.84, which gives you 1.26 million. Okay. Got to be really careful about the dates. Okay. We changed the life at the start of the year. The impairment arose at the end of the year. Okay. Uh, the carrying value of 1.26 is greater than that recoverable amount of 500,000. So therefore there is an impairment because the carrying value is greater than the recoverable amount. How much is the impairment? It's just the difference, isn't it? And that's recognised through profit or loss. Don't forget to talk about your financial statements in full. Uh, the 500,000 is the new carrying value of the asset, which is now shown through the statement of financial position. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to be uber clever, uh, that new carrying value would now then be amortised over the remaining life. Okay. Uh, but not really necessary because it only wants us to talk about the financial statements for this year. Okay. In future years, in 2017, then yes, uh, we would have, is it one and a half years left? So it will be amortized over those one and a half years. Okay. There we go. Uh, and hopefully what you can see there is you get plenty of marks. So I think there'd be a good two marks at least for the impairments. Okay. Uh, again, two or three marks maybe for the change in estimates. Uh, and again, two marks or so is it there for the intangible. I think the intangible was the easiest bit to get. So you get yourself an easy two marks there. Talking about capitalizing it, amortizing it and explaining where things go within the financial statements. The change in estimate, I think most people would have missed out upon that, okay, uh, because it doesn't jump out automatically at you. Uh, so where would you get the remainder of the marks? I think by identifying the impairment, that would ensure that you pass. I don't think that too many people would have got the right numbers in answering that, because those numbers were a little bit technical, weren't they? There was quite a bit going on. Because you needed to work out the 2.1 million carrying value. You had to have spotted the change in the estimate uh, and the new amortization. So the markers would have had to, you know, give some discretion there and let you use your own figures when you were talking about the numbers. So even if you got the numbers wrong, but you've spoken about your incorrect numbers in the correct fashion, you will get the marks right. So I think the key bit there is to take your numbers and say, well, look, there's an impairment through profit or loss. And this is now the value of the intangible at November 2016. There you go. Happy with that? Think you could do that within the exam? I'm sure you could. What I recommend that you do now is take that question, yeah, get a clean copy of it and work it through under exam conditions based upon what you now know. OK, don't look at what we've done. OK, don't copy anything out. Work it under exam conditions. Write it out as a proper exam answer. Okay. And see how your answer now will hopefully be much more improved than what you were attempting previously. Because the more you can do that, the better things will become. Other than that, yeah, keep working hard and keep practicing those questions. Good luck.